happy Friday. It's so nice to see you all. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn on Sustainable Gardening. I'm so excited for this one because Rowan Gorman, who's joining us from Cultivating Community, is going to be teaching us some really cool techniques that I'm very excited to learn about. Um, Rowan, you can go to the next slide. My name is Abby Bradford. I am the Outreach Manager for Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. My job is to help Mainers from across the state make our voices heard in the political process so that we can pressure our elected officials to protect our environment and take drastic action for the climate. MCV's mission is to cultivate and use political power to protect and conserve Maine's environment. MCV does this by helping to pass legislation that protects Maine's environment, to elect pro-environmental candidates, and then to hold all of our elected officials accountable without regard to political party. A few technical notes for today's event. You are all muted, but we do wanna hear from you. So please send any questions or comments that you have to me, Abigail, through the chat function, which you can find by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your screen. Um, and you should have gotten a, a message from me there and perhaps see it flash in orange. And um, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can message Will Sedlak also through the chat function and he can help you out. I'll keep track of your questions throughout the event, so feel free to send them as they occur to you. And then I'll ask Rowan your questions um, during the Q&A after her presentation. We are also recording today's event and we will share that recording with you all later this afternoon once it's ready. Um, Rowan, I'll turn it over to you. Are the um, slides working or would you like me to, to share them? I think they're working. All right. Cool. Okay. Welcome everybody. What are great- Oh, you're not, I'm not seeing, seeing them. Okay, hold on. Presenting. Yeah. Sorry about that. No worries. Is it a rainy day throughout the state? Raise your hand. All right, nice. Well, it's exciting though, because this too will help our gardens. Okay. Okay, how's that? Is everybody yeah. back on track? Looks great. Okay, technical difficulties. Thank you for bearing with me. So what an exciting day to dream about sunshine and growing food. Um, a little bit about what to expect today. I'll give you a brief introduction to myself and my work. And then we're going to move into step-by-step -step implementation. Talk a little bit about how those steps can be translated to a container garden if you are working with a small space. We'll have an opportunity to take some direct action and then we'll open it up to questions and comments. So my goal is that by the end of this, you will have the information and confidence you need to create a garden. So that means there is quite a lot to cover in roughly half an hour. So we are going to move quite quickly and I'll welcome any questions or follow up that is needed at the end. So my name is Rowan Gorman and I work at a food-based nonprofit that is based in Portland. We have a mission of food justice for all. So we really believe that everyone should have the right to access healthy food. They should be able to grow it themselves if they want to and they should be able to buy it at an affordable price. We work towards that mission in a wide variety of ways. So we have programs that are uh, intended for elementary school students, right up through programming that supports new American farmers who want to be growing at a commercial scale and starting businesses here in Maine. My work is um, in Portland with a network of community gardens and other urban growing sites. So I'm 
working directly with individuals and families that are growing food at a home scale. The first thing to think about when you're getting started with a garden is where to put it. So a few things to keep in mind when you're selecting a location. The more sunlight, the better. Many of the annual plants that we grow for food need a lot of sunshine. If you have an option that is partially shaded, I recommend really focusing on the greens rather than the crops that we eat the fruit from. If you have the option to have it somewhere where there is good airflow, that is going to reduce the amount of disease. So air circulation really helps keep the plants healthy. Another consideration is convenience. It's really um, all about your participation in this space. So if, if this is located somewhere where you happen to walk past on a daily routine, you're going to notice more, you're going to address issues and take better care of the space, and you're really going to harvest more, which is the whole point. Another consideration which can often get skipped is thinking about the logistics from the beginning. Where and how are you going to move materials to and from the site? How far is it from water access? And is it going to be in the way of snow removal and plowing? Once you have picked out the best site uh, to grow food, the first step that I recommend is to get a soil test. This is um, a really accessible resource that the Cooperative Extension offers. So there should be an office in your county. There's a representative in every county across the country. And this gives you a sense of what you're starting with. So most importantly, it, it will let you know if there's any lead or other contamination. So this is a concern if you're growing in an urban setting, if you're growing near buildings, especially older buildings that may have had lead paint. And it can also be an issue in rural sites. So a lot of old farmland, especially old apple orchards, were treated with arsenic and some other pretty heavy um, applications of fertilizers that sometimes stay in the soil. So um, there's also, if you're in Cumberland County, um, the Cumberland County Water and Soil Conservation District is doing some work helping to support people get, getting these um, lead and soil tests done. So you could also reach out to them for support. The type of gardening that I recommend, especially at a home scale, is creating raised beds. So a raised bed does not necessarily need to have a wooden periphery around it or a frame. You can see the larger photo is these sections of long raised beds, but they do not have any borders to them. So a raised bed basically just means having permanent areas where the food is being grown and permanent places where you're walking so that you can continue to keep the food growing spaces from getting compacted. I recommend having them four feet wide or a little bit narrower than that. Four feet is the distance that most people can reach across comfortably from either side. So you want to be able to reach everything that's growing in this space without stepping or standing in the soil. So if you have four feet, you can reach two feet from one side, two feet from the other. If you do decide to um, build a frame around the bed, it takes a little bit more labor and resources. However, you're going to contain the soil that you're building up so that it's going to continue to uh, stay in place and not erode or leach away. So this can be a great uh, opportunity to, to get it framed in from the beginning. If you do that, um, I recommend using a piece of wood in the center of the corner. You can see in the bottom left-hand image, 
there's the outside boards, and then there's an additional third uh, piece. And that is so that the grain on that interior post is vertical instead of going horizontally. So that when you're screwing the boards together, you're not screwing into the end of the grain of wood. If you screw into the end of the grain of the wood, that is going to um, rot quickly and loosen up those screws and that's going to be your weak point and that's often what falls apart first. So this is a way to get more life out of your um, construction project. I also recommend using wider boards. So if you want it to last for multiple years, you want to get lumber that's at least an inch thick, usually one to two inches is great. And I recommend a rough sawn lumber. That means it hasn't been smoothed. It hasn't been planed flat. So you're going to get more material and it's going to hold up better in the UV and the moisture conditions that it has to withstand. You can also use logs or um, whatever lumber you have available as long as treated. Another free resource is to use pallets and you can create a box, line it with landscape fabric. And this is a way to get a really deep soil that can even just sit on top of a driveway or other hard surface. If you do choose to use pallets, whether it's for a garden construction or compost pile, you want to look for a stamp on the wood, which indicates what method it has been treated with to ensure that it's not carrying pests as it moves throughout the, the country or the, the states, whatever its history has been. So it, all pallets need to be treated in some manner. Many of them are treated with chemicals and that's what we want to avoid using in our garden spaces. So what you're looking for is a stamp that says HT and that means that it's just been treated with heat. It's been um, baked at a very high temperature to eradicate any potential disease. And those are safe for us to be using. So the second part, in addition to the raised bed, is the pathway. And I recommend having pathways two feet wide. That's a comfortable width for us to walk. And it's also a width that as long as your frames are not too tall, you can still uh, wheel a wheelbarrow through there. The method that we use is laying cardboard down on the ground. And we're using cardboard the way a lot of people would use a landscape fabric. However, landscape fabric tends to degrade and shred into small pieces of plastic that are then uh, stay in the um, soil and they can also, the, uh, eventually weeds can grow up through them and the roots are really hard to pull out. So instead of using a plastic material, we use a natural cardboard, which is carbon, which will biodegrade eventually over time. And it does the same trick. So what the cardboard is doing is blocking out light and basically suffocating the sod beneath it. So if you block that light really well, you can get away with only putting like one to two inches of mulch on top and that's going to suppress any weed growth. The key here is to make sure that you're overlapping all of the pieces and that you're covering any holes so that the grass is not finding its way through. It's also an important factor to think about what type of wood chips you're using. Many of the wood chips that are easily available at garden centers are treated. So many of them are dyed and sometimes have um, treatments to help suppress growth, which is not really what we want to be bringing to these sites where we're growing food. So I recommend getting untreated chips. Sometimes they're sold as child safe or pet friendly or for playgrounds. You can also talk to a local arborist or sometimes a city crew is doing some uh, maintenance close by and doesn't mind bringing some chips your way. There's also some transfer stations 
chip wood that gets brought and resell that without treating it. Um, another fun project, you can see in the bottom photo, the wood chips are much deeper than one or two inches around the periphery. And that's um, so that we can add mushroom spawn for culinary mushrooms. And that's a really fun way to integrate another, uh, another practice and another protein rich food into your gardens. Once you have kind of the pathways and the growing space mapped out, uh, the next step is to reduce compaction. So I have uh, most recently uh, taken on a form of no-till. So I think um, many of you might be familiar with this theme or this method of gardening. And that really means that you're not you're not digging up and turning over the soil. So instead, we're working right on top of the soil ecology that's already there on the site. And we're just loosening and creating air pockets where, uh, where roots and water and nutrients can percolate down into the sod. The reason why I like to recommend no-till methods um, are that it doesn't require any machinery or fossil fuels so it's friendlier on the planet and also more affordable you don't need a lot of expensive equipment it's less work digging sod takes a lot of effort there's also less weed pressure in the future so weeds will only germinate and grow in the top four inches of the soil. So if you're continually turning over the soil, you're bringing up dormant seeds that are waiting in the soil and you're bringing them up to the surface where they can grow. Not tilling the soil also maintains the soil structure and is much healthier for the soil ecosystem. And that's really going to support good growth for the plants as well. So in order, even though we're not tilling it, aeration is still important. There's a few ways to accomplish that. So on the left, you'll see um, somebody utilizing a kind of specialized tool called a broad fork. There are two different styles. The one that is being used is a little bit more rugged, intended for hard packed soil. And you can see there's a second one in the background which is a little bit lighter duty. If you don't have access to a broad fork, you can also use what's often called a spading fork, which is what you see on the right hand side. And that's a much smaller multi-purpose tool that you can still use to basically poke holes and just loosen the soil a little bit throughout the whole space where you're going to be growing. So there's a particular type of no-till gardening that we've been putting into practice over the last several years. And this is a type of gardening that's called lasagna layering. So basically it's taking a whole bunch of different materials, putting them in layers to build up really rich, high in organic matter soil that is going to break down over multiple years and really create a robust soil ecology and set of nutrients to feed the garden space. There are pros and cons to every gardening method, uh, but for me, I've found that there are many pros to this that outweigh um, any of the cons that I have encountered. Some of the reasons that I like it is that it really concentrates on healthy soil and when the soil is healthy, that leads to healthy plants. And in turn, that means that the food that we're harvesting from those gardens is also nutritious and healthy for us in our diets. It also uh, leads to really high productivity. It's relatively low cost. And because it's utilizing a lot of readily available materials that are often part of the waste stream, it's very low or even a positive ecological impact. 
and it's increasing soil fertility and in increasing um, carbon sequestration. And it's also really low maintenance. So this method leads to very little to no weeding and very reduced water needs, which represent two of the most common tasks necessary for keeping a garden going. So the main idea with lasagna layering is to balance green materials, which are high in nitrogen, with black materials, which are high in carbon. And it's very similar to the methods that you hear talked about when you're starting a compost pile and you want to make sure that it's going to break down well and not smell bad or have some of those other um, undesirable side effects. So we're basically composting in place here. The first um, thing to keep in mind is to know your resources and to make sure that any materials you're bringing in to this layering process are not sprayed or contaminated. So you don't wanna be bringing in grass clippings from a lawn that's been sprayed with herbicides or pesticides, for example. Um, you might wanna, if you're bringing in manure, you might wanna find out whether that um, farm uses organic practices, et cetera. And the last thing to keep in mind is that this is a flexible recipe. So this is one set of materials that we utilized and it can be adapted to fit the resources that you have available to you. The first layer that we put down is granite dust. So this is unusual. You wouldn't think about spreading uh, stone in a garden space. However, stone is really rich in minerals and many of these minerals have been depleted and are not found in many of our soils. Many of our soils are really tired. So spreading a few handfuls of this stone dust can make sure that they're present in the soil and available to plants and available to us in our diets. Granite dust is a byproduct of stone cutting and can usually be um, if you have somebody who has a stone cutting business in your area, they'll usually give you a bucket. It's very heavy. You don't need very much, just a little bit to sprinkle is fine. You can also buy a product called Azomite, and this is basically the same thing. If you are using manure, it's a way to get a lot of nitrogen into the soil. However, it's a material that you want to be a little bit careful with how and when you use it. Make sure that you're not causing any health risks by spreading fresh manure. So try to get manure that's been aged for a little while and um, put it at the bottom so that you're not growing directly into it. And um, maybe don't grow root crops directly into it the first year that you are going to be eating. Um, and if you choose to add it in future years, this is best added in the fall when it can age for several months over the winter and then be safe to plant into in the spring. The bulk of the material that we use to build up the beds is old leaves. So leaf mulch is incredibly nutritious for garden plants and also very readily available. We have a lot of leaves <laughs> that fall here in Maine. So it's best if they've been aged a little bit, though you can also use fresh ones that have been raked up. It's best if they've been chipped. So if you shred them by running them through the lawnmower, they're not going to create mats that can create um, spaces where the roots have a hard time penetrating. Grass clippings can be used if they're from a clean uh, unsprayed lawn. And again, these uh, might have weed seeds in them. So like we talked about uh, before with turning over sod, you wanna make sure that anything that you're incorporating that might have weed seeds in it is buried at least four inches deep so that those weed seeds do not grow and cause you more trouble. If you are lucky enough to live close to the ocean, 
the seaweed that washes up on the beach is an incredible resource. It's great for gardens and it can be applied at any point in the process at any time of the year. We use the finished compost just as a very thin layer on the surface, so one to two inches deep. And that's just to create a finer material for young seedlings and seeds to get established in. We uh, use hay as a mulch. So one of the most important elements that I recommend to you is having some sort of mulch layer at, on the surface rather than leaving soil exposed. This is what's really going to make a big difference in terms of keeping the water in and reducing the amount you need to water and also reducing the amount that you need to be weeding. It's also going to really help build good soil ecology. So hay is a good option. It's easy to get locally and organically. However, hay is different than straw. Hay is basically a field that has been cut and so it will have some weed seeds in it. So if this is the mulch that you choose to use, we recommend spreading a layer of newspapers underneath and the newspapers will prevent the seeds from falling onto the soil and germinating. The newspaper is also creating another layer of carbon into the system. If you do use newspaper, uh, please check and see what your local paper uses for ink. Some are made with soy-based inks and are perfectly healthy and natural to utilize. Some newspaper printers are using uh, more harmful chemicals and you want to avoid incorporating any glossy paper. You can also use different mulches. So um, sometimes I just use the seaweed or the leaves as my top layer. And sometimes I purchase straw and straw is just the stems of a grain crop. So sometimes this has the grain seed in it. And so sometimes I still utilize the newspaper layer. Um, it depends on where you're getting your, hay, your straw from. Adding water between the layers can help the material break down and it can also help keep layers in place, especially the newspaper and the hay. You wanna make sure that that's wetted down before you get the first windstorm or you will lose all of that hard work. And then once you have all of those layers in place, it's time to plant. So planting into mulch looks a little bit different than planting into exposed soil. You can plant first and then put the mulch around it afterwards. However, I find it's easier to um, get the mulch covering the garden space and then just pull aside the mulch and or newspaper, make little pockets, take a couple of handfuls of that nice finished compost that you had as a surface layer and add in a little bit more right where you're going to plant. That's the best way to utilize that resource. So you can make a row or you can make little pockets to transplant seedlings into. All of these techniques can be utilized in two containers, which are a great way to still grow some food, even if you don't have a yard or access to garden space. The two biggest challenges with containers is not having enough space for the roots of the plant and also not having consistent water. So this is an easy way to create a successful container garden. You're basically using two five gallon buckets to create a false bottom, which enables you to have a reservoir of water that can percolate up through the soil gradually and keep it from drying out. So you can accomplish this by drilling holes on the bottom of the inner bucket for drainage and then drilling holes in the side of the outer bucket just below where the inside bucket is so that you have an overflow so that if it, that bottom section fills up with water, it's going to spill out rather than saturating the root system.
So one of the um, basic questions to start thinking about when you're ready to um, get into planting is whether to plant seeds or to transplant seedlings. So plants that have already been started indoors. This is the general rule of thumb that I use to decide or to know which things to need to be started inside versus which things to start directly into the garden space. So if it's the roots that you eat, this would be the carrots, radishes, parsnips, those plants generally do not like to be disturbed after they've been planted. Those are crops you want to take the seeds and put them right into your garden. If you're eating the leaves, so this is the spinach and lettuce and kale, generally you can do either. So these can be started or purchased as plants and moved out into the garden, or you can sow the seeds directly into the soil. It's the fruits, so the tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, that take the longest to produce. The fruit is the last element that the plant puts energy into after it's already grown. These are the plants that need a head start indoors so that um, by the time the soil warms up enough outside, they already have um, grown some and can be moved outside. When you're planting, I recommend using soil temperature as the best indicator of when it's time to plant each crop. So I just use a meat thermometer. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. The soil thermometers that you can purchase um, have different wording on them and some of them have a longer probe so that you can get them deeper into the soil, but it's basically the same thing. So you can use either knowing what temperature you're looking for and knowing how to space the plants and how deep to plant them is all information that you can find on a packet of seeds. So reviewing the back of the package will tell you a lot about um, what you're looking for. Um, I usually, I don't use a ruler, but it can be helpful to um, use your hands to know kind of some common uh, measurements and how they correspond to your hand. So for example, when I'm planting tomato seedlings, I know that I have, it's three hand widths to get the distance between tomato plants that I'm looking for. I, if I'm looking for planting a seed half an inch deep, that's down to my first knuckle. So those can be really easy ways without getting too specific to make sure that you're generally following the methods that will produce the best results. It usually does not need, um, seeds do not need to be buried as deeply as you would think. So the larger the seed, the more energy that seed is going to have to push up through the soil and it can be buried a little bit more deeply. If it's a very small seed, you just barely want to cover that seed because it doesn't have a lot of energy to push up through a heavy layer of soil. Uh, this is the most critical stage to care for your plants. So from when you first put them out, whether that's a seed or a tender seedling, it doesn't have a strong root system yet to be able to draw its own water and nutrients. So this is the time to really pay close attention and baby your plants a little bit or your seeds. Make sure that they're getting regular water. Um, once they get a little bit more established, they're going to need a lot less care. It's very easy to plant too much or to plant things too closely together. So um, it's hard when you're planting very small plants to keep in mind how big they are going to get. So really try to follow that spacing so that you have good airflow and good light so that you get good, healthy produce. And really, unless you have a plan for sharing your produce, which is a wonderful um, idea, it does very much to actually feed um, one or two people. So one or two tomato plants is going to produce probably as many fresh tomatoes as you want. 
unless you're going to give them away or make a lot of tomato sauce for the freezer. So um, it's easy to get carried away. Watering um, is something that uh, can, uh, is definitely necessary to have healthy plants. It can also be done in ways that can increase the risk of disease or um, create weaker plants. So I recommend watering in the morning. This um, gives the plants time to take up the water during the day when the sun is shining and it keeps them from having wet damp roots overnight when the temperatures are cooler and that can lead to some problems with root rot. It's also important to water close to the ground so it's a little counterintuitive because we think of the rain coming from high up however the more that moisture sits on leaves the more uh, it's kind of it opens up their pores so that then those plants are more susceptible to getting disease or to having pests um, creating issues with the the foliage of the plant so you really want that water to be going directly to the roots so whenever possible it's good to water underneath the leaves right onto the soil level it's also important to try to prevent splashing onto the leaves. So this is another good reason to have that mulch layer. If you have just exposed soil and you're watering or we get a hard rainstorm and that soil splashes onto those leaves, that's again a way that some disease spreads into plants. So harvesting, this is what it's all leading up to. So I encourage you to harvest frequently. The more you pick, the more the plant is going to produce. So keeping up on the harvesting is a great way to get more out of the garden over the course of the season. It's also a great way to uh, be able to harvest some baby forms of plants while creating space for others to mature. So this is a, particularly with root and leaf crops. So if things are too crowded together, they're not going to have room to get big. So for example, carrots, they're tiny seeds. It's really hard to space them far enough apart. That means going back through and pulling out many of them until the ones that are left are a, have enough room that they can grow into a full-sized carrot. If you don't take those um, in between plants out, you're going to have a ton of tiny little carrots. So what I do is I do that in stages. I'm going to need to thin some of the carrots at the beginning when they're very small. And then I leave them a little closer together than I eventually want them so that when they turn to the size of baby carrots, I can come through and harvest another uh, set of carrots that are a delicious snack and then increase the space for the next crop to grow even bigger. So the same thing can be done with lettuce or salad greens, kale plants, that type of thing. Another thing to keep in mind while you're harvesting is to harvest the older portions of the plant first and allow the younger section of the plant to continue to be growing and producing more food. So that often means uh, this really applies to like um, plant uh, greens, like kale, chard, lettuce. You want to be harvesting from the bottom up or the outside in. So it is the inner part of the plant or the top part of the plant where active growth is happening. And those are the parts that you want to leave so that they can continue to regenerate. So there's a couple of takeaways that I'd like to leave you with. One is that there is no right way to garden. So there are many right ways to do this. And I encourage you to experiment, figure out what works for you and what works in your particular location. It's also important to remember that plants want to grow. 
this is their mission in life. So you don't need to get it perfect. You just need to get it good enough and the plant is going to grow and take care of a lot of the rest. All right, so moving into an action step of what you can do. I honestly believe that choosing to grow food in an ecologically positive way and supporting others in your community who are doing the same is one of the most positive actions you can take. This is an incredibly good way to build resilience and also build community. So I encourage you to grow some food at whatever scale you can. Think about sharing and donating some of what you're growing. There is a lot of food insecurity in our state. There are many people who don't have access to fresh vegetables and this is more of a concern now than ever before. You can also support others who are trying to make a living doing this in your community by purchasing from local farmers and many of them um, are pre-ordering, are creating arrangements so you can pre-order boxes to be picked up. And there's also an opportunity to subscribe to a CSA, which is a community supported agriculture. And you're basically paying upfront for a season's worth of food deliveries so that you're giving farmers the resources at the beginning of the season when they can really use that money to put into getting the crops established. And then you're being able to have a surprise fresh delivery, usually on a weekly basis throughout the season. One opportunity to sign up for one of these can be found on our website, cultivatingcommunity.org. We offer a CSA that is grown by the new American farmers who are part of the farmer training program that we manage. All right. Um, thank you so much, Rowan. We are actually joined from someone else from the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, um, who I'm realizing I'm actually going to have to unmute. One second. There you are, Harley. Um, we can tell you about some other options of things you can do. Take it away, Harley. If you're able, let me, let me know if you can't unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, so I wanted to, to mention a couple of things, a couple of resources that folks can access on the MOFCA website. Um, that's mofka.org. Um, first of all, we do have a listing of farms that are selling seedlings this spring. Um, so certified organic farms that have seedlings available. Um, and folks can find that by going to mofka.org and scrolling down to the, um, the image that says resources for gardeners. And there's a map of the state so you can find um, farms selling seedlings near you. Um, if folks are looking for other ways to, to buy organic produce and support um, main organic farmers, uh, we also have a searchable database um, that you can find by clicking on find organic in local products at mofka.org. And we also do have some more uh, learning opportunities coming up this spring for beginner gardeners. Um, we have a couple of webinars in May, one of which will cover some similar ground to what Rowan has talked about today, focused on planning your garden. And then one webinar at the end of the month, all about dealing with pests, ideally preventing pest problems before they arise. And we'll have some more webinars um, being announced throughout the rest of the season as well. Um, so that's, that's all I wanted to mention. Thanks a lot, Abby. Sorry, I, I tried to send what you were saying through the chat, but if there are any other links, feel free to send them to me and I can send them to everyone else. Sure, I'll share those with you. Great. Um, all right, everyone, let's move into our Q&A session. You have all been sending some awesome questions through the chat, which I've been keeping track of. But if other folks have questions, feel free to send them to me, Abigail, through the chat now. 
Um, there are a lot though, so I fear we're probably not going to have time to get through them all. So I'm going to save them and then um, Rowan and I can tag team um, possibly following up and, and we can share our contact info at the end. All right, Rowan, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. And I should say that was so wonderful. So like simple and clear, but a lot of new information, um, even for me, having worked on an organic farm in the past. Um, one interesting question from Becky, and this is a technique that I'm not familiar with. She said she would like to use coffee grounds and wood ash to side dress her garden. Um, are there plants that that's okay for and plants that that's not okay for? Those are both materials that can definitely be integrated. So the coffee grounds are more acid. So those are great for blueberry bushes in particular. They can also be incorporated into a garden and balancing them with a material like the wood ash, which is very basic, so very non-acid, is a really good combination. And if you um, get that soil test, done at the beginning, that'll give you more information about the pH balance of your specific site and whether you need to um, maybe err on the side of more or less of those particular materials. Thank you. Um, Dave asks a more general question. How do you keep deer from eating your garden? <laughs> Always a challenge. So uh, there are many techniques and like much of the pest control methods, sometimes they work better than others and it's trial and error to figure out what works on your site. There are some crops that they don't like, like uh, there's a aromatic herb called rue that sometimes you can plant as a boundary that they don't want to cross. However, if they're hungry, they will cross that. So uh, building a fence is generally the only foolproof method. They don't like um, jumping into small areas where they can't readily jump back out again. So if you have a small garden space, you can sometimes get away with a smaller fence than you would need to if it was a, a large area where they could kind of feel more comfortable getting a running start and jump over something. Um, you can also experiment with uh, spreading different types like of coyote urine or there's some other ways to dissuade them. All right. Um, why is it that you don't want to step on the soil around your plants and compact it? Why do you want to have separate um, paths? That's a great question. Um, so healthy soil that grows uh, plants the best is actually, I'm going to get the exact number wrong, but it's between 40 to 60% air. So though we think of it as solid, there's actually a lot of air and gaps in that soil. And that's what allows roots to move well and water to move well uh, with, through those um, gaps in the soil structure. And it also, um, it, soil structure is kind of delicate in order to um, have the really healthy soil ecology. So there's a ton of little microscopic um, insects and fungi and bacteria that are all part of supporting that plant to grow well. And if we're walking, we're compacting that down and we're um, taking the air pathways out and the channels that a lot of those uh, microbes and soil biome utilizes in order to um, create good quality hummus that can feed the plants. Um, we have quite a few questions about lasagna layering. Um, do you have to wait a while for those layers to, to set, to do anything, or can you plant in them right away after you've built them up? Best case scenario, you would do them in the fall, let them sit, kind of um, rest for a little while, start to break down, and then plant into them the next spring. However, I can tell you from experience that that is not necessarily true. So we have um, implemented several community gardens where we have immediately planted um, right after finishing the construction. So we finished one garden in August and immediately planted some 
end of the season crops into that successfully. And we've done other ones that were wrapped up um, mid spring and we went ahead and registered gardeners to utilize those spaces immediately. So we haven't seen any problems with planting into them right away. You could build one this spring and start off with a garden this summer. Is it safe to create lasagna layering gardens over contaminated soil? Um, someone mentioned that in Portland, there's a lot of soil contaminated with lead, et cetera. Um, will those contaminants leach up through the layers or does that help um, protect your garden from those contaminants? That's another really important question. And there's a little bit of ambiguous science about just how much the bottom kind of soil that you have in place will interact with the crops that you're planting into these higher levels that you're building up. So um, I would say if the soil is very contaminated, the best approach would be to create a uh, more of a barrier or a bottom to your box and build up so that you're not having roots um, finding their way down into that contaminated soil. If your soil is um, slightly contaminated, building up these really um, nutritious layers can encourage the roots to stay uh, in, in that portion of the soil and reduce the amount of contamination that they will be drying up. And it's also um, important to know that when you get a soil test back, it'll, it's not all or nothing. So different types of crops and different portions of a plant concentrate contamination and heavy metals to greater or lesser degree. So most contamination is concentrated in the leaves and vegetative portions of a plant. So depending on the levels of contamination you have a, on your particular site, you may be able to grow tomatoes where you wouldn't be able to safely grow and consume spinach or kale. So knowing the particulars is really important. Um, you mentioned an alternative to granite dust. Um, what was that called? I'll spell it out and send it through the chat. Sure. It's called azomite. Z-O-M-I-T-E. Um, another pest control question. Um, you already talked about deer, but what about um, smaller things like squirrels, skunks, possums, groundhogs, etc.? Um, those are some of the hardest to control for because they do just go up and over a fence or under a fence. Um, creating space around your garden. So a lot of those animals don't like to cross open areas. So if you don't have a lot of bushes or branches close to the garden, that can discourage them from crossing those exposed areas and accessing your, your food crops. Great. Um, uh, you, is it okay to use cardboard instead of newspaper in your lasagna layer? I would recommend keeping the cardboard um, in the pathways if you're planning to plant into it within the next few months. Because the cardboard is a heavier material, it is going to um, create a little bit of a barrier, a layer where water and nutrients are not percolating through and a barrier where small root filaments would not be able to pass. So if you wanted to do it and leave it for long enough for that cardboard to biodegrade, that would be fine, but it would be a little um, harsh to use directly in a garden where you want to establish plants right away. We have a question about CSAs, um, which Hillary, you can um, feel free to hop in and field this as well. Um, do you anticipate that CSAs are gonna be overloaded this year? Um, this particular person is, is considering just planting their own garden and not doing a CSA this year, if so. I know for us specifically, uh, many of our CSA sites were offices and places of work. And because many of those are not currently operating in the same way, we 
don't have as many of those larger drop-off sites, so our CSA membership is currently down for this season. Hillary, do you have any insights on the um, farms throughout the state? I'll unmute you again. Thanks, Abby. Um, yeah, I think that um, certain farms are reporting more interest than usual in CSAs, but I think in general, there are lots of CSAs out there. And I'd really encourage people, if they're interested, to contact the farms directly. Um, because I think there are, there are a lot of different options that are, that are available. Thanks to you both. Um, for using seaweed in your lasagna layerings, um, should you rinse it first and or dry it before putting it down? Great question. Um, you would think that there would be issues with salt, which is something that you generally do not want to have in your garden. However, we have never run into any indication that salt builds up and soil testing supports that experience. Um, we've talked to many gardeners and farmers who have been implementing this technique for over 20 years without any ill effect noticed with the productivity of their soils. And just to be clear, this is seaweed that's washing up onto the beach. So you're harvesting dead plants. You're not um, cutting anything that's growing. It's um, best to um, ideally let it uh, sit for like a day, potentially before spreading it, um, getting it higher up on the beach. It's more likely to have gotten a little bit of rain and sun. Um, but I caution you against leaving it for very long before spreading it. It will get very smelly if it starts to sit and uh, rot on its own. If you spread it out into a thinner layer, it'll dehydrate quickly and the smell will not be an issue. We have a question about seed viability. Um, can we use older saved seeds and do world seed vaults have um, specific techniques we can use to maintain viability in the seeds that we save? Generally, keeping your seeds cool and dry are the two biggest factors to keep them viable over time. Different types of seed are um, better at holding on to their viability than others. So there are some crops that you can use older seed that'll still germinate really well. And some, um, so like for example, uh, corn and beans tends to be um, pretty stable. Uh, other types of seed like carrot and lettuce tends to lose its viability and not sprout as often um, after just a couple of a year or two. Um, you can always test your seed by spreading some between layers of damp paper towels and then um, after a couple of days opening it up to see if there are roots establishing. Um, and if viability is low, sometimes I still use that seed and I just sow it a lot more thickly because maybe half of the seeds are going to grow. Um, so it's not, you don't necessarily need to throw it away. All right, we only have one minute left until one. Um, there are still a lot of other questions. So like I said, feel free to reach out to us and um, I'll share these questions with Rowan. Um, Rowan, thank you so much. That was so wonderful. And thank you My pleasure. everyone for joining us. Um, I hope that you all have a great rest of your Friday and happy gardening. Thank you all for being here. Bye-bye. Take care.